uh, every two years. Also in 1994, you probably know, the internet became available, which has changed the world, I would maintain. And we were getting bored with trying to make a scientific revolution, at least I was. I mean, we'd been at this for like 20 years, 74 to 94, and you get tired of making the same argument over and over and over again. And so my thought was, let's just declare victory and move on. <laughs> and I'll say more about that as we go. Uh, also, another thing that happened was my other, my colleagues who were working with me on, actually I was working with Heinz von Forster and others on promoting second order cybernetics, said that what I was doing was not second order cybernetics, that I should read more biology. And that's what alerted me to the fact that there's a difference between what they were interested in and what I was interested in. And so I simply made a distinction between biological cybernetics and social cybernetics. But in any case, getting back to the shift toward normal science, probably many of you have read the book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It made an enormous impact uh, in the early 1970s uh, on universities. And the reason was, and here's an example of the previous theory and the new theory. The previous theory was that knowledge grows incrementally. It's like uh, I think Newton said he's just a midget standing on the shoulders of giants or something like that. Uh, so it's an incremental process. And this is the way textbooks are written, that each new idea builds upon previous ideas. But Kuhn, who started off as a physicist, read some of the original works, and he says, that's not what happens. He says it's a very chaotic, highly political uh, a time whenever you have one of these major shifts and that you have factions and people try to capture the high ground like they try to put their doctoral students uh, at the best universities and they try to take control of the journals. It's, it's a very competitive kind of a system uh, when one idea triumphs over another idea and that's why he came up with this notion of scientific revolutions. Well, when he described this process that of a normal science, scientific revolution, normal science, scientific revolution, he focused primarily on the transition from normal science to revolutionary science, which is what he called incommensurable definitions. And that's what I showed you a moment ago, you know, the first order cybernetics and second order cybernetics. Anytime you see a table like that, maybe you've got a scientific revolution. You certainly have a debate. But Kuhn doesn't say very much about how you go from the scientific revolution back to a period of normal science. There is, however, something in science called the correspondence principle. Heinz von Forster pointed this out to me. It was originally proposed by Niels Bohr when he was formulating the quantum theory in the early 1900s. And it states, any new theory should reduce to the old theory to which it corresponds for those cases in which the old theory is known to hold. That is, a new dimension is required. You can draw a picture of it like this, where you have um, the small circle is the old philosophy of science, uh, the large circle is the new philosophy of science, or the new theory. So you can have the old theory and the new theory, and then a new dimension has been added. Now, what the correspondence principle says is that all the evidence that supports the old theory should also support the new theory. But by adding a new dimension, you increase your ability to explain phenomena. So you should be able to explain additional phenomena. And in the case of second order cybernetics, the dimension that we're adding is the amount of attention paid to the observer. That is, previously, the idea had been don't pay attention to the observer, exclude the observer. And scientists went to great pains to exclude the observer. This is the notion of controlled experiments and, um, and experimental groups, control groups and experimental groups. Yes? In that, in that figure, it, it, it means that uh, every new science or new development should 
the extinction. Extinctions? Extinction, yeah. That every new... Everything that was uh, uh, dis described before should be described in a new one. Yeah, okay, the question is that everything uh, that was described before should be described in a new one. Yes. I am trying to yes. interpret that uh, uh, yes. as image. Yes, that's correct. The, uh, all the data that was accepted previously should still work. The data. The, the data, the experiments, and so forth. Uh, and now, th this is one of the reasons why the correspondence principle is so useful when you're trying to end uh, a, a period of scientific debate. Because what it means is the guys that have developed the theories up to now didn't do, uh, their work will not be forgotten. In a sense, their work will be maintained. It's just that you're going beyond. You're extending it. Um, and I'll give you an example from relativity. Uh, what that says is that the moving mass is equal to the rest mass divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This is from relativity theory. Uh, c is the speed of light. V is relative velocity. Most of the time in the human world, v is very small relative to the speed of light. So this reduces to the square root of 1, which is 1, which means the moving mass is equal to the rest mass. In those cases when the velocity approaches c, then this number becomes less than 1. The square root of a small number is a small number. You divide by a small number, this becomes big, which means that the moving mass is larger than the rest mass. And the same with length and time. So in the case of relativity theory, you have incommensurable definitions. That is, mass, length, and time are fixed in the old theory, or mass, length, and time are variable in the new theory. But it only holds in those cases in which relative velocity is reasonably large, which you don't encounter much. <laughs> now, another example would be the gas laws. The early gas laws dealt with pressure, volume, and temperature, and they treated molecules as a point mass. That works well in this room, where the diameters of the molecules are very small, relative distances between the molecules. But as your technology improves and you can compress your gases, compress them and cool them, it turns out that di the diameters of the molecules become important and you have to take account of that. So you have to add a new dimension. And after you add the dimension, then you can begin to com predict what's happening. And what we are doing in this case is we are adding amount of attention paid to the observer which affects all scientific disciplines, at least to some degree, some more than others. Certainly the social sciences more than the physical sciences. Uh, but any description is constructed by an observer. Okay. So my point here is we wanted to go from a period of revolutionary science where we were simply making the distinction between first and second order cybernetics declare victory, go to a period of normal science, and then engage in a new period of normal science. And in order to do that, you have to formulate a dimension. And the dimension was amount of attention paid to the observer. OK. So the stages in the development of cybernetics in the United States, sort of recapitulating, were first order cybernetics or engineering cybernetics, which was from the 40s to about 74. Then second order cybernetics, which was uh, the role of the observer, biological science, 74 to the mid 90s. And then social cybernetics, a more con a larger concern with uh, intellectual movements, philosophy of science, and so forth, uh, beginning about the mid 90s. Now, another thing that happened that we worked on uh, was the year 2000 computer problem. Probably everybody here has heard of the year 2000 computer problem. This was the notion that uh, 
people in the early days of computing uh, were trying to save space, and so they abbreviated dates from 60, 1964 to just 64. And, and I remember in a programming course when I was a freshman uh, in the 60s, they said that won't work in the year 2000, uh, but everybody's doing it, so go ahead and do it. <laughs> and so we did, and we forgot about it. And then somewhere in the mid-1990s, everybody said, hey, you know, this equipment's not going to work uh, when we pass the year 2000. And uh, it was a big problem. I mean, it was a really big problem. It was the largest uh, international technical cooperation. I'm trying to remember what the numbers were. It was something like 500 million spent worldwide, 100 million spent in the United States, and 10 million spent by the U.S. government, something like that. It would, there were very large numbers. But by then we had the internet, and so solutions could be shared. But the year 2000 computer problem is often cited as an example of a highly successful international project because uh, everybody's equipment had to work given the interrelatedness of it. Um, and uh, if it didn't work, everyone uh, would be hurt. And so knowledge was shared and it was dealt with. During this time, I was working with a man named Carl Mueller uh, at, in Vienna. And he created a very nice theory of the evolution of complexity. I'll refer to this again a little bit later. But what he referred to was genotype and phenotype. Circularity once again. Uh, this is a gene, this is an organism, this is information, this is an organization or a society. And you have this interaction so that variation occurs here and selection occurs here. New ideas occur here, whether they work is decided here. And then he took that farther and he defined several kinds of societies. The first is a Darwinian society uh, in which variation occurs in the genes. Then there's a Piagetian society, Piaget, Swiss psychologist, who looked at how people's ideas change as they grow up. And here the idea is that you have uh, sufficiently complex organisms that they can change their behavior within the lifetime of the organism, okay? In other words, your behavior is not determined by your genes. You can learn new patterns of behavior and change those patterns of behavior. Then you have a Polanyi society um, Polanyi was a Hungarian intellectual. Actually, there were two, Michael and Karl Polanyi. Here the idea is that human beings can come together, form a coalition, form a government, and establish laws and enforcement mechanisms to change the behavior of individuals within society. And then you have what Mueller, Carl Mueller, calls a Turing Society. A Turing Society is a society that consists not only of human beings, but also of what he calls Turing creatures. Turing creatures, named after Alan Turing, are chips, control systems. They can, your automobile has several of these that controls braking, fuel mixture, and so forth. There are thermostats in rooms. Uh, they're all over the place. And in developed societies, you probably have several times as many Turing creatures as you have humans. But the idea here is that if your society consists of not only human beings but also Turing creatures, what if they all go on strike at the same time? Or if a large portion of them do? Well, that was the vision of the year 2000 computer problem, that your chips and your controllers would start behaving erratically. And it turned out that that was not as big a problem as was feared.